Ache Willow Season 5 Chapter 2 Never a Dull Moment If you could travel through alternate realities and visit different versions of our world, versions where things have gone differently by but a single grain of salt, you would find a strange iteration of me. She wouldn't be too different from a fundamental level. All the same ingredients would be there, but a subtle variation in their preparation results in a vastly different product. The same way eggs, water, and flour can result in pasta, bread, or pie crust, it would have only taken but a nudge for Miriam Dufour to have never become a baker and a cook. There was a brief moment in my youth when, after learning about all the fascinating interactions that transformed silky batter into fluffy cake, I gave sincere consideration to becoming a chemist. It's the alchemy of it all, which I suppose also ties back to my roots as a Dufour. How can one not be consumed with curiosity when learning how two elements, each with their own properties, can be married to become an entirely new form of matter that behaves differently in all respects? Salt is a common but very apropos example. Sodium explodes when coming into contact with water, and chlorine is a toxic, corrosive element hazardous to most living tissue. Yet together, they can safely mix with water and enhance the flavor of almost any dish. It's a little like that with Eric and I. Alone, neither of us would be caught dead in a tavern. Eric once visited clubs and bars on a regular basis, mostly during his studies and only when single. It's the social aspect that attracts him. The loud music, dancing, and crowds of strangers give him a high that I could never understand. Meanwhile, I've always been more of a pub girl. Take me somewhere that serves a good beer or cider and has a bustling kitchen. The smell of rich stews and fried fish and chips wafting through the air, mixed with animated debate and maybe a small band playing across the venue— None of the pizza rolls and microwaved cocktail wieners that pass for bar food in your average drinking hole. Together, though, anywhere will do, as long as they close late and won't get upset at our shouts and guffaws. If a place comes with a reliable recommendation, then we're all in. Normally, I would have rather gone to the Lady Godiva. They have good food and a cocktail menu as long as the list of ingredients in a traditional mole. However... It's also a place rich with distressing memories, not to mention that it's far too clean for our purposes. Which is how we ended up at La Cachette à Louis. Not only does it have the benefit of being on the Quebec side of the border, where Annabelle can legally drink, but she also knows the owner and can guide us through their suspiciously long list of bourbons and scotches. It's the kind of place only locals bother going to, and where they look at you funny if you order water. Louis has two televisions above the bar, one still an old-style CRT, and they either show the news or a hockey game. If someone asks, they'll flip the channel to football, but not without protest, and never during NHL playoff season. We drank and talked and laughed, Annabelle guiding our flight towards increasingly aggressive liquors. Where we started with whiskeys, I'm not certain we didn't end up sipping turpentine. Eric regaled us with a tale of his graduation party exploits. It sounds like the inane garbage I'd expect a frat boy to recount, but from my brother, and while a little tipsy, every game of beer pong sounds like an epic jousting match. Every victory of his, another honor to the name du four. In turn, he comforted me as I recounted my ill-fated romance with Agnes. It felt like a confession repeated one too many times, but also with a more therapeutic angle. Telling Eric, an outsider to Aquilo, someone with only passing knowledge of the true nature of this place, was like breaking a taboo. There were tears, terrible fries, laughs, and too much spirits. Annabelle traded infatuation for fascination, and while her hands were always quick to find my brother's arms, she seemed far more interested in him as a link to my past than as an object of affection. I'm proud to say that none of us stumbled out of Louis, each walking far straighter than logic and biology should have allowed. 
Eric is massive and can hold his alcohol, and though he matched us glass for glass, he never exceeded our intake. Mine were the steps that were the least stable, but I surprised myself with feeling not a teaspoon of dizziness, aside from that afforded by a rare sense of euphoria. And Annabelle? The youngest and slightest of our stupid little trio, she might as well have been stone-cold sober. Walking side by side with Eric, she would jump atop narrow curbsides and walk them like a tightrope, certain of every step. Witchcraft, I thought, a silly smile covering my words. So, Annabelle calls out, clear as a bell, but loud as a sailor. Tell me, good sir, now that you've gotten to know me, what does this Dante of yours have that I don't? My hands find the bottom of my pockets and I stifle the shiver. Every inch of my skin feels flush and the early spring night feels chilly upon my arms and neck. Still, I'm warmed at seeing these two precious people getting along so well. My brother raises a hand so Annabelle can steady her walk before offering a reply. Well, apart from the obvious, he has the most luxurious beard this side of the Saint Laurent's. His shoulders put mine to shame, and he's a great workout partner. We studied architecture together, so we've always got a lot to talk about. Hairy chest you could brush with a rake. Drives a convertible. His family has a cabin up north near Mont Tremblant where we go kayaking. <laughs> okay, Annabelle laughs. I get it. I'll grow out my beard. Sheesh. For the first time, she stumbles a little and has to steady herself on Eric's shoulder. We've wandered some way from La Cachette à Louis. If I look farther down the street, I can see the dimly illuminated sign of the Aquilo Café. A corner behind us, if I turn to look, I suspect I'll see Gulliver's truck, parked near Pearls of Wisdom, Ophelia's knitting shop. It might be my imagination, but I could swear a cold gust blows from that direction. There's a bank and an alley across the street, and all the way ahead, where the street lights go dim, Aquilo Border Park. I think of eventually bringing Eric there during the night, and my good humor wavers. My feet stop carrying me, and I stand, watching my siblings march on ahead. This is fun, isn't it? My eyes turn skyward, coming to rest only once they've isolated the bruised orange outline of the solitary cloud that looms over Aquilo. In a few hours, the sun will come up and I'll open the cafe again. The cheer will wash away, along with the first few sips of coffee, waking me up from this all-too-brief dream. Then, the real work begins. Willing my feet to move me forward once more, I ponder what secret of Aquilo to tell Eric next. There's simply too much to unload at once, and certain things are better shown than told. My thoughts are ripped asunder, torn like theater curtains, pulled down to reveal the truth hidden behind them. A scream, echoing with horror and fear, pours itself out of the alley next to the bank. It's long and anguished and loud. Even Eric and Annabelle, a solid 40 meters ahead, are frozen in place by the sound. It's written in Annabelle's face as she looks for my own expression. We've forgotten something important, something crucial, and sometimes vital. This is Aquilo at night. The hell was that? Eric asks as he gets near. What do I tell him? That it could be a demon, a ghost, or a mugging gone wrong? What will we see running out of this alley should we stand still a minute longer? A criminal? or some ethereal monstrosity? I don't know. I push out the answer, squeezing it into a barely audible whine. You okay there, Mims? I am not. Months of cultivating my identity as a more than suitable replacement for Doris, constructing this myth that I'm somehow up to the task of facing the demons Aquilo has to throw at me, yet I'm paralyzed by an inanimate, narrow corridor of concrete and bricks. This one alley that I pass every day, forcing myself to give it no second thought, bears its teeth from the depths of my memory. This is the alley. The one where Clara Payne died, wearing red socks and a matching red sweater, killed by a demon that longed to feed an insatiable hunger. Tonight, the alley, quiet for years, screams to me, is it the ghost of Clara, demanding a justice that was never granted her? 
a new horror lurking in those piss-smelling shadows, waiting to tear off whatever body part it needs to make its existence bearable? Keep an eye on her, Eric orders, putting Annabelle's hand on my arm. Then he runs into the alley, swallowed by the darkness. Of course he would do that. My brother is built like a truck. What does this Sasquatch of a man have to fear in even the darkest alley of a small rural town? If someone needs his help, isn't he the perfect candidate for heroics? Except there are more fearsome things lurking in Aquilo than we are taught to be afraid of. The moment Eric's form is fully consumed by shadow, Annabelle and I exchange a furtive, worried look before we follow him in. The last time I went through this alley, a solid two years ago, it was a shortcut. There's an exit on the other side spilling onto the U.S. side of Aquilo. The worried part of me, the one that remembers Clara Payne's body in most vivid detail, hopes that whatever it was that cried out has made its way there, leaving nothing for us to find. I have enough scars, physical and emotional, from the demons of this town that I need no more. But those are the thoughts of an older, more afraid, and naive version of myself. The Miriam I want to be is brave, carrying the responsibilities and legacy of the Dufour name with pride and courage. The alley follows the rough outline of an S, twisting in two places with the garbage and recycling bins of local businesses nestled in the middle. A stray thought for those responsible to the empty bin sneaks in between images of whatever demon or ghost we're likely to encounter. Eric wanted proof of my claims of supernatural events in Aguilo, and I'm afraid tonight might be when he gets it. My eyes still struggle to adjust to the lack of light when we arrive at the second twist in the alley. Lack of sight lets the fragrance of decaying garbage dominate my sense of smell and tear up my eyes. Yet, it's more welcoming and safe than the pungent aroma of blood and the telltale stench of voided bowels. There will be no dead bodies to find tonight. My confidence in the matter is as amusing as it is disquieting. Perhaps it's the ghost of Clara Payne we'll meet instead, bound by trauma to the place of her death, her sudden demise tethering her spirit to this lonely alley. My success at giving rest to the departed is mixed, but it remains a familiar challenge, one that I'm almost eager to take on. For Clara, for me, and for my still raw ego on the matter. Are you okay, ma'am? No demons, no monsters, and no apparitions wait for us next to the bins. Weak light paints impressionistic outlines of two figures— one clearly Eric's, and the other of a shaking, hunched figure holding what seems like a short length of rope. It took Puffin! A shrill, desperate voice answers. Odessa Ellison. She drinks steamed milk with an assortment of three cookies. She always sits next to the window in the cafe so she can keep an eye on her corgi, Puffin. Short and impatient, Miss Ellison isn't my most endearing customer— but I have a soft spot for how she'll hold up her three cookies to the window and let Puffin choose which he wants. Odessa will then eat the other two, drink her milk, and leave with her delighted dog. But now, Puffin is gone. The leash harnessing the goofy little dog severed only a foot from Odessa's hand. He's gone, she insists. Some monster took my Puffin. I stand alone against the beast. A short night has passed since the sobering encounter with Odessa. The intoxication of drink and the joy completely flush from my system, leaving behind only the dread of that terrible alley and Odessa's words. Some monster. Anywhere else, I would assume the act of man behind the abduction of her cherished puffin. In Aquilo, the list of potential suspects broadens to impossible lengths. At this moment, however, I'm confronted with a monster of my own. Hissing and angry, I once again face down the copper and brass abomination that serves as my coffee machine. I could, and some would argue should, replace the damn thing with something more modern. But a full bar, restaurant coffee machine, capable of steaming milk, making espressos and cappuccinos, is a prohibitively expensive venture. 
Not to mention that there is an element of tradition to using the ancient steampunk monstrosity. To its credit, the mass of winding tubes and valves is capable of assembling an impossible variety of drinks. I've yet to hit a wall on what it can produce, and invariably, the results are some of the best coffee I've tasted. On the flip side, each cup comes at a toll of frustration, pain, and occasionally scarring wounds. The machine extracts payments in blood by spitting out jets of scalding steam and demanding unreasonable effort whenever pressed into service. What if, Eric says, leaning over the counter as he watches me work, and hear me out, what if you're doing it wrong? My eyes target him like those of a mother bear on a potential threat to her cub. Except, instead of my young, the fragile creature I'm keeping safe is my ego. And instead of claws and teeth, I use the well-honed edge of a disapproving glare. Would you like to have a go at it? I threaten. There are only a handful of patrons littering the dining room, and no one at my counter besides Eric. Those assembled for caffeine and pastries, reading their newspapers and typing on their laptops, have no idea that a man is about to be wounded. Eric, cocky to a fault, pushes himself off his stool before making his way around the counter. He pulls up the sleeves on his arms, showing off the musculature he spent so long defining. I just need an Americano, I instruct, stepping out of his way. My hands find the pocket of my apron, where my wooden spoon, notepad, and pen make their home. There's also the bill for Meredith Mitchell's funeral feast, which I have yet to give to Horace. I'm a little nervous. I want Eric taken down a peg, but not maimed. With broad gestures full of flair, he places a cup under the dread machine's spout before appraising the collection of knobs and levers before him. He's about to pull on something seemingly picked at random when the chimes of the Aquilo sing their welcome. Oh my! Olivia Fig saunters in. Are we training a new employee or punishing a bad customer? Or both? Olivia walks into my cafe as if she owned the place. In fact... Olivia walks most anywhere in Aquilo in the very same way. It was a long time when I thought her confidence to be comforting, even empowering. There is a woman who takes crap from no one, I imagined. That hasn't changed, but earlier this year, I discovered that Olivia has been keeping secrets from me. Important things hidden in the maze of her orchard— she was one of my great-grandaunt's closest friends and yet has told me precious little about the formidable Doris Dufour. I'm teaching a master class in humility, I say before turning back to Eric. The customer would like two sugars and a cream in her coffee. Olivia gives me the eye and shakes her head a little, but does nothing else to interfere otherwise. She knows me, and she knows the coffee machine. What's this? she asks, settling down next to where my brother was seated. Dropping her massive purse to the floor next to her, she picks up a length of nylon strap, bright electric blue with a loop on one end, while looking frayed and severed on the other. The leash to Odessa Ellison's dog. Puffin? Olivia runs her thumb, elaborately manicured, over the ruined threads. What on God's green earth has happened? I kneel down behind the pastry display, looking at the variety of desserts and baked goods like a queen surveying her kingdom. I know by now that asking Olivia what she would like is futile. Until I have biscotti that meet her impossible standards, she will always leave me to choose for her. Another Aquilo mystery, I answer in a glib tone. Standing up, almond croissant in hand, I'm greeted by an immaculately plated cup of coffee placed in front of Olivia. She stirs her drink, mixing cream, sugar, and anticipation. How? I didn't hear any swearing or cries of pain and frustration from Eric. Infuriatingly smug, a grin splitting his face from ear to ear, my brother stands next to the coffee machine with both fists on his hips. I really don't see what the problem is, he says, an invitation to sibling violence in his voice. You, I seethe at the coffee machine before I'm interrupted. It's not the first time that the damned contraption bends to another's will only to spite me. If I didn't know better, and sometimes I wonder if I do, I'd swear the thing had a will of its own. Ahem, Olivia says, putting her spoon on the saucer next to her cup. Manners, darling, 
Isn't an introduction in order? I allow a deep, resigned sigh to escape. Fine. Olivia, this is my brother Eric. Eric, this is my good friend Olivia. You guys met a few years back when I was in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Olivia smiles, raising her cup to her lips. I remember. You've put on some weight, young man. Good weight. I'd rather all my friends stop swooning over my brother, but I suppose that can't be helped. It's better than having all of them hate him. With an idle hand, I pick up the broken leash from the counter. Olivia sips her coffee, nodding her approval at the taste. Meanwhile, I imitate her motion of running my thumb over the frayed end. Something's wrong with it. I can't tell if the nylon's been torn, chewed, or cut. For all I know, it might have just been worn out and Puffin simply made a run for it, off on his own adventure to find some secret stash of cookies. My inspection is cut short by the door chimes, welcoming more customers. Amongst the handful of regulars, ready to worm between the others to get inside first, I can see Annabelle. Her shirt is fresh, but I recognize the same pants from the previous night. Her eyes look a little heavy, and her head moves with the hesitation of one with a nasty hangover. You look like someone pulled you out of a clogged drain, Eric says, manning the coffee machine once more. How sweet of you to say, Annabelle says, unslinging her canvas bag to take a seat. So, any idea what got little Puffin? I follow her eyes to the thing in my hands. My thumb is still rubbing against the frayed edge, as if it could pull a solution right out of the threads. None. For all we know, he just up and left to find his destiny. On one hand, Olivia says, that dog is far too small and well-treated to ever want to leave Odessa's side. On the other, I interrupt, Puffin is also kind of dumb and excitable. Mm-hmm, Olivia approves. I stuff the severed leash into my apron pocket, expecting to put it out of my head and get back to work. I'm about to do just that when my fingers rub against a stray piece of paper. Folded to fit an envelope, Horace's bill for the food at his wife's funeral remains undelivered. If I had the option, I wouldn't even charge the poor man. The Aquilo lives on tight margins, however. While I can afford him a deep discount, I must at least cover my costs. Hey, Eric? My brother mumbles his acknowledgement while preparing more coffee. Enough to fill a pot this time. I try to spy on his technique, but at a glance, I can't find anything in his method that differs from mine. Since you look like you can handle my cafe better than I can, do you mind holding down the fort for a while? I can make coffee, Miriam, not run your business. I just have this one quick errand to run. Entangled in the operations of the coffee beast and caught flat-footed by the request, Eric stumbles to produce a further complaint. By the time he does have something to say, I'm already walking through the door. Make sure he doesn't screw up, Annabelle. The long walk to Howard Mitchell's home takes me to weird places through Aquilo. In the 20 or so minutes from the front door of the Aquilo Cafe to the humble house where he and his wife lived, I cross the Canada-U.S. border three times. Going back and forth between countries without a hint of hassle or barely noticing the transition. The weather is gentle and cooperative. Gray rolling clouds hover high in the atmosphere, too pale to threaten rain but too thick to let much sun through. A sharp eye can still make out the unique shape of the ever-present cumulus that always hangs over town, but otherwise this feels as normal as it gets. Early in my walk, I pass in front of the alley where we found Odessa Ellison crying for her lost dog. I slow my pace, perhaps hoping that I'll see traces of Puffin and put an early end to this particular mystery. No luck. The Mitchell house isn't exactly what I expected. Aquilo has a lot of farmhouses, but those are usually attached to a farm or orchard, or, in the case of the Flanagan place, a winery. The home Horace used to share with his wife is a strange oddity. It has all the hallmarks of a typical farmhouse, two stories high, fenced porch surrounding the entire building, wood paneling on all sides, but it's flanked by a couple of commercial establishments. On its left is a modest real estate office, while on the right a clothing store boasting all of last decade's fashion does business. It's as if all the land that was once a farm had been sold. 
keeping only the home of the owners as a lonely artifact of the area's original purpose. Milky orange glow from the doorbell beckons to be pushed, and, as one could expect, a ring straight from the 70s echoes through the house. Under normal circumstances, one would expect the muted cracks of wood as old floors are walked upon before the door is open. Not at the Mitchell home. Here, the entire house explodes in a cacophony of barks, meows, and bird calls, as if the full menagerie of a pet store had been stirred to action. By the time the door opens to a haggard and disheveled Horace Mitchell, the orchestra of animal noises has somewhat subsided. Oh, he says, surprised to see me, or anyone, at his door. Ms. Dufour, what a pleasant surprise. I smile a pleasant smile, as full of warmth as I can muster. Looking at his watery eyes and seeing the minute tilt of his head, I'm reminded of how he compared me to Philemon Dufour. It's tempting to ask for an explanation, but the red cornea and humid streaks on his wrinkled cheeks tell me now's not the time. Good morning, Mr. Mitchell. I hope I'm not bothering you. Not at all. He steps aside and opens the door wide. Please, come in. I was, uh... I was just about to call you anyway. The house is dimly lit, relying on the graying sky streaming through small windows for illumination. There's a complex aroma to the home. The smell of decades of long-simmered food seems infused into the very walls of the property, while the air around us is a confusing mix of cat litter, dog food, shaved wood, and wet newspaper. Before the door closes behind me, a veritable pack of dogs surrounds me. They're small dogs, two teckles, a shockingly quiet chihuahua, a pug, and a corgi. That last one reminds me of Puffin, but he's smaller with a more pointed snout and darker fur. All of the dogs are lovingly groomed. I'm sorry, Horace says, doing his very best to keep the excited pack under control. They don't get many visitors. I should start walking them again more frequently. It's fine. I just wanted to drop off my bill and check up on you while I was here. Everything going okay? He smiles and nods, lying with his entire face. This is me at my most Doris, mothering my customers and members of the community. I learned how from watching Olivia, but the why seems like an expected aspect of owning the Aquilo Cafe. It's not something I ever thought I would fall into, let alone be good at. But that's something else that connects back to cooking. You can't really make a good meal if you don't put in some care, can you? It's a good thing you came, he says, shuffling further into his home. You forgot this. I follow, drinking in the details of the place. There's something reminiscent of the apartment I inherited from my great-grand-aunt, Walls crowded with photos, the chronicles of those who lived here. Where Doris's memory lane is paved with images of the town's history through her eyes, the Mitchell House is a gallery for Horace and Meredith's relationship with their endless menagerie. Dogs of more breeds than I can count, cats uniformly aloof but in an impossible array of color and fur lengths, and snails and hamsters. So many snails and hamsters. It's almost unsettling. Here you go. Horace hands me my chafing dish. I had returned the rented one, but had completely forgotten about my own. I must have left it at the reception hall. Oh. I take the dish from him, tearing myself from a photo of Horace and his wife holding about a half dozen hamsters each while smiling at the camera. Thanks. Would you like to see them? I don't. Nothing against hamsters. Or snails, for that matter. But there's something uncomfortable and oppressive about standing in this dark house, surrounded by this poor man's aura of misery. But how can I refuse? For the first time, while talking about his hamsters, I can see some twinkle of joy in Horace's eyes. Sure, but I have to leave right after. If I could have answered with a sprinkling more hindsight, I would have likely chosen to take a rain check on this one. It's not a simple menagerie that the Mitchells have. It's a veritable zoo. A room dedicated entirely to cats. Their litter boxes and food bowls distributed evenly on the floor, cat trees in the corners and sturdy shelves covering the walls. 
The back of the living room is hidden with stacked hamster cages. There are bags of wood shavings poorly hidden behind a reading chair. The constant droning of dozens of wheels spinning by the power of tiny paws fills the air. Of all the rooms, it's the garage that stands out the most. Perhaps because of my own business, I pay special attention to the warehouse-like qualities of the Mitchell garage. The sheer quantity and lack of organization would send me into fits of anxiety. Sacks of dog food and piles of leashes clutter the limited space. An old car, faded red of an unrecognizable make, is hidden behind in a fort of cages and tattered cat beds. The only item that remains easily accessible is a small refrigerator, which Horace informs me contains all the medication for the various animals he takes care of. Are you ready for what Meredith called her crown jewel? He asks, hand on the knob of a bedroom door. I assure you, I am not ready for whatever Meredith thought was her most prized possession. There's no time to answer before Horace twists the handle and pushes the door open. By then, it hits me. Of all the animals I knew the Mitchells to own, the one creature upon which their reputation as a weird couple of Aquila was founded, I have yet to see. The snails. Doesn't disappoint, does it? Horace says, a sad pride in his voice. It certainly doesn't, though I'm not sure my reaction is what he was hoping for. A wave of thick humidity, cool and pungent, escapes the room. I can't be sure, but I could swear that a thin fog blurs the view. The bedroom, though small, is more of a museum or exhibit, a collection of eclectic wooden desks, all suffering from the constant humidity line the walls. Two pedestals, plaster columns likely rescued from a garage sale, fill the middle space. Every surface is covered with a terrarium. Every terrarium is filled with a disgusting number of slithering snails. Some are as small as a thumbnail, dotting the walls of their glass homes. Others, few in number, are as big as my fist. Surrounded by the diffused glow of terrarium light, Horace Mitchell turns around, arms akimbo to look back at me. Thick eyebrows arched and lids blinking away tears, he stands amid his wife's prized possession. Aren't they beautiful? Aquilo is written by J.F. Dubow and narrated and produced by me, Amy Frost. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platform. Want to support the show? Buy us a coffee. Go to ko-fi.com slash Aquilo to donate. Aquilo has a Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash Aquilo for details. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under the username Aquilo. Aquilo.